Good morning, everybody. This will be somewhat a European perspective uh, to the digital revolution in education. And it reminded me that I once walked in the US into a pizza place and I ordered pizza and said, put less cheese on it. And the guy looked at me, the waiter, and said, you've got to be European. And so when you give a talk about the digital revolution in education and you don't want to be don't want to talk about technology, you also, I think, got to be European. Because we tend to take a different look at things, and I hope that within the next 25 minutes, it will become clear why and how. So, accidentally, I'm using a somewhat similar picture, describing the digital revolution or the tsunami as Michael Moe did yesterday. And when you see this wave, the good news is the revolution has finally begun. And I, in 1993, wrote software for Cornell to introduce online teaching. And in 2002, as Minister of Higher Education in one of the German states, tried to introduce the digital university and failed. And so it finally happens. And those people who run around at this conference usually see themselves in that position. You know, it's great to surf on a wave. But I work for a think tank these days, and our clientele are educators. And when we talk to them, they have more that picture in mind. They're afraid of what's going to happen to them. And therefore, the key message of my talk will be if we want to make that revolution a success, let's focus more on people than just on technology. And I will try to lead you through my arguments in four steps. So first, I want to talk about the challenges we are facing in the system. Secondly, I want to link those challenges to potential digital solutions. And then, most importantly, I want to take a look at what it all means for the stakeholders in the system. And once we understood what it means for the stakeholders, there's also a call for action of what we can do. And all that is supposed to fit into 22 minutes, but I think it will work. So let's talk about the challenges in the beginning. I mean, one challenge we are quite aware of is access. And the question is, do we simply have too many people wanting to go in education? And if you look that the worldwide enrollment in tertiary education has tripled during the last 20 years and there's no end in sight, it definitely is a mass phenomenon. The mass is not so much the issue than the heterogeneity. And if you talk today to an educator and you ask them why their life is harder these days than a while back, they say, because my students or my pupils or whatever, they're too different. Heterogeneity is a problem rather than a natural state. And if you look today at American university students, and 75% are considered atypical in the sense of being older, studying online, studying part-time, then you see that we even in tertiary education have a huge heterogeneity. Quality is an issue. And the problem is we know it's teachers, and we can't find enough of them. But we also know Hanushek's studies on the PISA results that a good teacher in the classroom in one year has one year advance in learning compared to a bad teacher, because he's getting the pupils one and a half years ahead, and a bad teacher is only doing half a year. But we don't find those teachers. Employability is number four of the challenges. You know, it's not enough to have a degree. You actually got to get a job. And if you look at the numbers, 13% of mail carriers and 13% also of parking lot attendants in the US hold a bachelor degree and probably will never be able to pay back their tuition. Number five, it's a very inefficient market when you want to get a job. There is a German study we just had that about 2% of applications actually lead to employment, 98% lead to nothing. 
What's missing? Cost. I'm not going to call it cost here. My last challenge is scalability. Our current system is not scalable. And what I mean by that is the following. If you increase the number of students, you have a linear increase in cost. Maybe some have managed to level out that curve, but compared to other industries, we have not been able to really get something out of scale. But that's not the bad part of the message. The harder part of the message is what happens if you try to deal with growing heterogeneity. And that's another curve here. That's the inflation-adjusted cost per pupil in the American school system, and that's the outcome. So the outcome in the last 40 years has been absolutely flat, but inflation-adjusted cost has more than doubled. And if you look now at a system growing in numbers and growing in heterogeneity, you've got to multiply those two effects. And then you are in trouble. The system we have is not scalable. So what do we do? Coming to the potential of digital solutions. In our research, we find six major effects of what the digital revolution brings to the education system. Number one, massification. We're all used to that. Those are you know, MOOCs and pieces of learning software and so on. Um, great to get more access. Up to now, it's a little more for the very motivated and gifted students. Number two is personalization. It's somewhat volatile, the belief whether it's really going to work or not, but at least some products are working. Number three is gamification up to virtual reality. Number four is something we really haven't talked enough about, I think, even on this conference. That's peer-to-peer -peer learning. WeQ being better than IQ. And the question is how digital platforms can structure, we, WeQ can structure peer-to-peer -peer learning in a way that actually everybody profits when you don't learn with a teacher. Number five, orientation, finding your way through the jungle of opportunities e-advisor, degree compass, products universities are using, and number six, job matching, making education more valuable, trying to link employment needs with educational outcomes, job descriptions with resumes, and trying to find the right jobs for people. So we've got the challenges, and we got six solutions or drivers for change from the digital side. And the question is, how do you match them? And the question is, do we talk enough about the fact that to educators that actually digital is solving their issues? And we don't. We talk about massification, but we really don't link it to access. We talk about personalization, gamification, peer-to-peer -peer learning, but we don't really link it to the fact that you can deal better with heterogeneity and overcome the quality problem. Same is true for orientation and job matching. We don't really talk about employability and improving that. So the first message is, let's not only talk about what digital is bringing, but let's talk more about what actually the effect is on the challenges educators are facing in the classroom, in the lecture hall every day. So that brings me to the stakeholders. And it's not enough just to tell them we solved your challenges. We really need to understand better and think more about how the individual, how the institution, how the teacher or the educator in general, and how the society feels about the change that is happening. So let's start looking at the individual. It's not really, when you come at least from the more privileged classes, it's not really great to be educated in the digital age. It was more comfortable before. I mean, if you have Laszlo Bock, you know, the head of personnel from Google, telling you that the GPA you were working so hard to get counts for nothing, 
and that the reputation of the university you paid so much money for to get in counts for nothing when you want to get a job, you could potentially question whether you're doing the right thing, trying so hard in high school and university. So what do we tell the learner? We say, you've got to learn every day your whole life. For 20% of the population, that's a great message. They're really thrilled and curious because they are able to learn something new every day. And 80% of the population is so happy when they're done learning and can close the book finally and never look at it again. We think too much about the 20%. What else do we tell them? We say a reputation doesn't count of the institution. You might have gone to Stanford. That's not a predictor of your future success. We're going to test you anyways. We're going to test you continuously. And if you want to apply for a job, we have this great online game out there. And you compete with 120,000 other people for that one job playing the online game, completely independent which school you came from. Global competition. And we also have all the learning data that might not make everybody comfortable. So it's not a very good situation to be as an individual. And then look at the institutions. You know, we talk about unbundling for them. And when we believe Christensen from Harvard, you know, half of them will be bankrupt within 15 years. That's a great message when you want to tackle the digital revolution as an institution. What else do we tell them? We say, well, you've provided the whole package, but now you better focus. You know, you better focus on either, you know, content production or just reduce yourself to tutoring or reduce yourself to certification. I mean, talk to the colleagues from San Jose State University how they felt, you know, when edX or whoever introduced the online products to their school. We talk about scaling and strong brands in the digital age. You know, we tell them a few will survive and the rest will be not visible anymore. And worst of all, we tell them we can measure competencies in a more relevant way to the labor market than you can certify credits in your school. They relied on their degree all their life. I mean, that was what an institution made, the institution of higher education. You had the right to give out those certificates, to certify those credits. And suddenly somebody else comes and says, you know, I can do independent of the educational path measure educational outcomes much better than you can do with your credits. For a few, those are good news. For many, it's pretty bad news. Number three, the teacher. That's a mixed subject in the sense of the good news and the bad news. There's one teacher, I like her quote very much. She's teaching with videos from Khan Academy. And she said, you know, since I've been doing that, you know, I don't have to teach the standards or the stuff I actually can teach kids. That's great news. It's a little harder for the professor in the lecture hall. And if you look at what unbundling means for them, that's a hard message too. Because we tell them there will be a few stars. By the way, they'll be highly paid. And they'll stand on stage. And the rest of you can be a tutor, or maybe can be a grader. And then you look at the salary scheme, and you see what large educational companies in the US pay for graders. They pay about $13 per hour. Construction worker minimum wage is $18. And you don't need a PhD for that. And you don't feel comfortable about being a university professor. I mean, again, talk to the people at San Jose State. When you moved into a position you weren't educated and hired for. And the last view goes to society. I like Daphne's quote very much when she said, we don't know where the next Einstein lives. That was at the very early stage when she founded Coursera. And she said, you know, maybe she's in a little village in Africa. Globally, that's great news for equity. But for those who live in the by now or up to now privileged areas of the world, that's not very good news. I mean, it's increased global competition for jobs. I mean, all the fairness, all the equity we bring, fortunately, to the developing world means more competition 
for our societies in Europe and in the US. And by the way, a completely new role for government. You know, governments, at least in Europe, felt responsible for actually offering all the education. And suddenly now they're reduced to just providing the framework and somebody else will be doing it. Quality control instead of an operational role. So that's a big change for societies. So when we really understand those stakeholder issues and when we see it's not all positive messages to them, the question is what can we do? And I'm finishing up with a call for action. So if it's happening, the question is, how do we convince the guys holding up the help sign that they also can ride the wave? And number one for me is frame this revolution with a more careful language adapted to the needs of the stakeholders. So the digital revolution really solves your problems. It's not yet another problem. We've been talking to those educators and saying, hey, there is a disruptive revolution coming. And they said, I have enough disruptive problems in my classroom. I don't need another one. And so let's frame it that it really helps for globally more equity. I mean, equity is an issue every educator's heart has a very positive attitude toward. They all thrive for equity. So it's not just technology, it's for more equity and more fit, more quality in education. Number two, it's about pedagogy. It's not just another tool. I mean, when you talk these days to any kind of ed tech company, they say, oops, we discovered it's not only just our product, it's a whole model. It's a change management process. It's much more complicated than we thought. So what we really need to do is first invest in the people. I mean, tell them first and teach them first how to personalize their learning. And then say, we've got a tool to support you. I mean, we run in Germany a teacher training program for personalized learning. We take a whole school for 11 days through the process of individualizing learning. And we don't mention technology. And in the end, the educator says, if I personalize the curriculum for every single student in my class, I spend a lot of time on the copy machine. We say, yeah, there is a solution. But we first, for the first 11 days, we talk about the pedagogical concepts. And then we come with technology. Number three, I think we actually have to consult the institutions. I mean. There are a couple of great institutions like ASU, they can consult others. I mean, they've gone far away with developing a strategy for the digital age and they can you know, transfer their knowledge to others. But we gotta do that on a wider scale. And unfortunately, you only bill by the hour for that business. You know, that's not venture business going up through the ceiling. And so nobody is really interested in doing that. It's so much easier to produce a product and hoping that it really scales than to have something where you hold hands for the institutions and support them and also governments by really developing a strategy for the digital age. And I purposely don't say a digital strategy because then it's stuck at CIO level and it's about how to use tools. It gotta be at president level and the question is how to change my pedagogical concept, how to change learning, and what kind of digital tools do I need for that? Number four might be a surprise. I think even though it seems comfortable to be in unregulated markets, that the education industry should push for more regulation and even put self-regulation into the scheme. The reason is, if because of missing regulation, something goes really wrong, it's going to destroy a lot. I mean, data abuse, data security, things like that. I mean, remember what happened to InBloom. I mean, whatever they did, they basically wanted the right thing. And they lost $100 million. Because there wasn't even any regulation, they could measure what they were doing against it. They couldn't say, I'm, I'm sticking to the regulation, I'm doing it right, because there was none. I mean, there was no scale they could measure. 
And so if you don't have you know, a meaning of what is right and of what is okay, you know, we, we might either go over and then destroy really something, or we can't talk to the people and say, yes, no, I'm doing the right thing because there's regulation I'm adhering to. And my last point goes a little beyond the digital. And you can increase employability by a better match. But in the end, you really can thrive in employability only with employers. There is no employability with employers. And in Europe, in Germany, in Switzerland, in Austria, in Holland, we have about 500 years of experience with our apprenticeship system. And we learned in those years that it's not a bad idea to actually develop a curriculum and to run operations in education together with companies, even for governments, even for governmental institutions. And so my last point is we got to connect with companies, run dual programs with two responsibilities, even in the digital age. And if you look at people like Udacity, it's what they're basically trying to do to increase employability. So what I have done in the last 22 minutes, I took you through quite a story. I told you first, there are six challenges we have to address. Access, growing heterogeneity, quality of teachers, employability, matching, and cost or scalability. And then I said, the six effects the digital revolution brings, massification, personalization, gamification, peer-to-peer -peer learning, orientation, and matching has to be linked to the challenges in order to gain acceptance. And then I looked at the stakeholders, at the individual, at the teacher, at the institution, and at societies. I tried to understand their perspective on the digital revolution and said in order to meet that, we got to frame it differently than we do. We got to invest into pedagogical concepts instead of just throwing technology at them. We got to consult the institutions, both on school level and at university level. We got to push for regulation and even self-regulations with governments, and we got to link up with industry in order to increase employability. And if you take all that, then I hope you understand my message with which I began. It's about people and not about technologies. Thank you very much.